Thank you. I wasn't sure what story you was going to tell on me. You know something about relatives and churches? And they always find the worst things sometimes to tell on you. We thought that guy was a biker that came in the service that day. Somebody told me he was a biker. And he was. After he was told he couldn't speak, well, he went and got on his bicycle and rode off. <laughs> but we thought we was really facing an enemy. Well, it's been good to be here. And it's good to once again be in your anniversary service. 62 years when churches all around us are closing down, but you're still going. 32 years in the pastorate when preachers are getting out of the ministry, but he stays there. And I've noticed that all through this week, we've been talking about Brother Dave and 32 years and, and the pastorate leading this church. He's done a great job. But I also want to think about his wife because she's the one that stood behind him. She stood with him. She picked him up when he fell down and dusted him off and sent him on ahead again. That's what wives do. She's been faithful to the things of the Lord and I appreciate that. Well today I guess I better preach because we, you probably want to go to lunch about noon. Is that right? And all week long I've tried to meet the time schedule and I've failed every single time. <laughs> So I'll, I'll try to try to do this halfway quickly this morning. We enjoyed teaching in the college age class this morning. And uh, I'd never quite been in a situation like that. They were all set around tables like, you know, like businessmen and women. And, and I looked at that and I said, well, this is not going to work for me. I can't preach sitting down. You know, it'd just be like if I come up here without a tie and tried to preach. I can't preach without a tie either. And I've got to have a dress shirt on. And uh, I appreciate your college uh, group, though. They were all very well dressed and very kind and very gentle. They didn't hurt me at all. In Hebrews chapter 12, we read in verse 1 that, Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which doth so easily beset us. And let us run with patience the race that is set before us. Looking unto Jesus, Amen. the author, the finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus we pray today that we might glorify his name. As we read your word and we think about the many things that are coming to pass in our day, that Lord, you'd help us to continue to run that race. You would help us to continue to be able to run that race with patience. That Lord, we might run that race without that weight of sin tied to our backs. That Lord, we might run it for the joy that awaits for us when we get home. Thank you, Lord, for our heavenly home that thou art preparing for us. Thank you for the promise that you're coming again. Thank you, Lord, for the churches that are standing today for the faith of Jesus Christ. Give to them that joy and give to them that peace and give to them that love. And for us gathered here today, would you meet with us, dear Lord? Would you console us, instruct us, encourage us, lift us up, send us on our way with new renewed strength and courage? For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. As we look into these verses, I, I, I saw some things today that I, I believe are getting ready to go home. 
You know, Jesus told us in John 14 that he went to prepare us a place that where he was we might be also. He said, in my Father's house are many mansions. Nobody's ever seen them. Well, I guess maybe Paul did, but Paul said he couldn't tell us about it. And uh, John, he looked up into the heavens. There's some things that God told him and he couldn't tell us about. There's some, vic there's some victories. There's some significant things in heaven today that I have not seen or heareth heard. Uh, for those, it's waiting for those that believe and trust in him. Sometimes our life might get a little rough down here. But I, I notice that the, the joy of the Lord stays with us through rough times as well as good times. I, I wanted you to know just three things here tonight. And, or this morning, it will be night later but heaven is waiting every one of you that are running for Christ today, heaven is waiting you, you, can, just, you can just put it in store that heaven is waiting it's not going to go away I just, I'm just amazed God made the heavens and the earth in six days and he's taken 2,000 years to make my home does that tell you anything? He's a master carpenter. But the second thing is I wanted you to see was the, that, that sin is easy. He said there, let us lay aside every weight and the sin that does so easily beset us. Sin brings weight with it. Sin slows us down. Sin, sin takes away our joy. Sin takes away our peace. Sin nullifies the gifts of the Holy Spirit of God in the book of Galatians chapter 5 verse 22. And, and, and I tell you, I don't want to lose those things. And therefore, I need to fight against sin. And then and also I wanted you to notice the race. I am not built for racing. I don't know if you noticed that or not. I look pretty slim up here, I know, and look pretty dapper and pretty good. And Thank you for smiling only. No, I'm not built for a race. I can do an endurance run, but I can't race. I, I remember times when my boys, uh, they got pretty cocky, you know. They thought that they were pretty tough stuff and they could outrun Dad. And our driveway is about 150 foot long back there in Oregon. And so I just thought, all right, we'll just see if you can. I'll bet you that I can catch you before you reach the end of the drive. Now, I knew that if I didn't, there was no chance because I'm a short runner. But I caught him. I can move pretty fast when the time is arriving. So we find today that we're in a race. And sometimes we have to move fast and sometimes we just move slow. Sometimes we just keep on running when we feel like we want to quit. And this race of life sometimes gets like that. Leo Tolsky said, the distinctive mark of this age is its lost sense of God. Today we must say that the distinctive mark of our present age is its lost sense of sin. I believe today that Christians are falling subject to that spirit of wickedness that Ephesians chapter 2 tells us about. That within our midst, sin is coming into our hearts and into our lives unannounced, but accepted and not rejected like it ought to be. We are getting lax in our stand uh, for the Lord God. I find that the holier we esteem God to be, the more heinous and loathsome sin seems to us. The trend in our world today is to ignore, deny, or make a mockery of sin. Liberal preachers are denying human depravity. Psychiatrists, by negating sin, seek to rid people of their guilt complexes. The new morality says any immoral conduct is acceptable between consenting adults. The situation ethics being taught claims that moral behavior should be governed by situations, not the Bible. While millions blindly refuse to admit it, our world is reeling and rotting with disease and destruction caused by sin. Clamoring or crimes of violence are increasing. Sexual perverts brazenly pervade, parade the streets. 
a clamoring for their rights. Pride, greed, covetousness, cheating, lying are commonplace. More and more sexual promiscuity is being accepted as normal human behavior. Many are living in calloused, open adultery, wantonly defying the laws of God. The only effective deterrent to the rampant world-destroying evil is to revive, understand, teach, and forcibly proclaim the Bible message of sin. Sin is at the bottom of our problems in America today. Sin is what's wrong with our lawgivers. Sin is what's wrong with our congresses. Sin is what's wrong with our high offices. The Bible tells me today that sin is a terrible, terrible thing. I must look at sin like God sees sin. God loves me and anything that would harm me, anything that would deter me, anything that will pull me down from what I could be, God is going to hate it because he loves me. You love your children and you need to teach them God's word that they might be successful in their life today. How are we to understand the meaning of sin? It has come in so many different forms, so many different colors, uh, so many different ways. Comes in and we just gladly accept it and before we even realize that it's there. Davis Bible Dictionary said, Any want of conformity unto or transgression of any law of God given as a rule to reasonable creatures. 1 John chapter 3 verse 4 Whosoever commit a sin transgresses also the law. For sin is transgression of the law. You read on down in the book of Galatians in chapter 3 and verse 10, 11 and 12 For as many as are of the works of the law are under the curse. For it is written, Cursed is everyone that continueth not in all things which are written in the book of law to do them. But that no man is justified by the law in the sight of God is evident for the just shall live by faith. And now verse 12, And the law is not of faith, but the man that doeth them shall live in them. Today we have arrived at, at what the other side of sin begins to look like. On the front side of sin, it looks beautiful and inviting and something to make one wise, something that would be good for our life, something that would be desired. But when we get to the other end, we find the man laying in the gutter of life, ruined and hopelessly wrecked. The Zondervan Bible Dictionary giving words for sin meaning transgression, impiety, evil disposition. Uh, the, the primary Greek and New Testament words for sin meaning missing the mark, depravity, unrighteousness. It's difficult to improve upon the summary of the meaning of sin found in the notes that Dr. Schofield wrote in the Schofield Reference Bible, the old Schofield Reference Bible. I find that sin has come into our world today and many young people have been slain by it. I, I hear of young people proclaiming themselves to, to be homosexual or claiming themselves to be lesbian and, and claiming that it's natural and that it's right. In this world, maybe it is. But in God's world, it's wrong. The Bible pronounces judgment upon it. And I'm sorry. Those young people need to hear the Bible because if they want to be successful in their life, they're going to have to follow the Word of God. In the, in the Bible, the, book, the sin is called transgression, the overstepping of the law. Back in the book of Psalms, chapter 51 and verse number 1, where David cried unto the Lord because his sin had brought heartache and his sin had brought death and his sin had brought shame uh, unto him. And he cries out, uh, Have mercy upon me, O God, according to thy loving kindness, according unto the multitude of thy tender mercies blot out my transgression 
Oh, I'll tell you today, folks, our sin cannot remain in us. It will rot. And it will cause all the good things in our life to be tainted with that rottenness. And that, that smell of ungodliness will be there. And sin is also uh, called iniquity. An act inherently belonging by nature or habit. Wrong whether forbidden or not. As Romans chapter 1 verse 21 says. Because that when they knew God. They glorified him not as God. Neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish hearts was darkened. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools, and changed the glory uh, of the uncorruptible God into the image made like unto corruptible man, and to birds, and to four-footed beasts, and creeping things. Sin is not only transgression, not only iniquity, but it is also error, a departure from right. And so Sometimes we choose to do that. In Romans 1.18, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth and unrighteousness. 1 John 3.4, Whosoever committeth sin transgresses the law, for sin is transgression of the law. My friend, today people don't want to believe in the wrath of God. But it is here. It is upon us today. We are suffering some of the wrath of God right now because of our sin. We let sin stay in our lives. You will meet the wrath of God. You let sin stay in your life. Though God loves you, he is not going to let his children continue on in sin. I believe today that many a, a God-fearing person at one time is now dead because they let sin go on in their lives. I've watched Christians and I, I find that Christians who live by the standards of the world today have broken homes and broken children and broken lives just like the ungodly because sin plants the seed of rottenness in our life. I find that sin is also missing the mark. Failure to meet God's standard. My friend, the wages of sin is death but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ my Lord. I tell you today I'd lost rather have the gift of God than the wages of sin. Would you not? I would much rather I look forward to a heaven coming and suffer all kinds of persecution here on planet earth but knowing that one day I would be ushered into the kingdom of God and that I would be able to, to see the throne of God. I'd be able to see Jesus. I would see the angels all around me. Jesus would take me by on those golden streets of the city of New Jerusalem and lead me up to a mansion. He said, Roy, there's your mansion and it will be worth it all when I see Jesus. Amen. It will be worth it all. The time, the trouble. Some of us get, into, get so busy we can't go to church, we can't read the Bible, we can't pray, but it will be worth it all when you see Jesus. Don't let Satan tell you those terrible things. Sin is trespassing the intrusion of self-will in the sphere of divine authority. Sometimes we think we know more than God does. In Ephesians chapter 2 and verse number 1 it says, And you hath he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins. Sin is a killer. Sin is a killer. I remember in the old days they used to preach about alcohol. They said that alcohol was a killer. And you've just got to stay away from it. My friend, sin is the killer. Alcohol is only a part of it. There's drugs and there's wrong thinking today. There's men that, that are turning to their own hearts and to their own ways. And they're worshiping the gods of this world. It's a killer. Then we have lawlessness or spiritual anarchy. 1 Timothy chapter 1 verse 9 Knowing this, that the law is not made for the righteous man but the, for the lawless and the disobedient for the ungodly and for sinners for unholy and profane for murderers of fathers and murderers of mothers for man slayers Oh, I'll tell you, no wonder they wanted the Bibles out of the schools No wonder they don't want Bibles in your hand No wonder Satan has copied so many different Bibles uh, Inadvertently leaving out this verse and that chapter and this word over here. 
No wonder because he doesn't want you to hear the word of God. For the word of God is the power of God and the salvation. Today the word of God is the most powerful book that's ever been written. And you and I have a copy of it in our hand. And when we read that book it transforms our lives. It will transform the lives of those people that are around us. It will infect us with a joy and a peace and a love that the world cannot understand. But sin is unbelief. An insult to divine truthfulness. John 16, 9 of sin, because they believe not on me. Oh, I tell you, I've seen people come to our church. We even have a man now that's been attending our church. And he'll come for about three weeks and then he won't come for three or four weeks. And I know why. Even his wife told my wife the other day she knew why. Because he gets under conviction. The word of God convicts us of our sin and our need to be saved. But pride nails us to the seat. Pride and the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the pride of life nails us to our pew that we will not get up when the invitation is given and men and women don't want to walk down the aisles anymore and they don't want to fall on their face before God and say, God, I am a sinner. And I'm lost. And I'm on my way to hell. I'll tell you what, I, I'd like to see that man saved. Maybe if you think about it, you'll pray for that man. God knows who he is, doesn't he? I find that sins of the unsaved are acts of rebellion against God, proceeding out of a nature which is in a state of spiritual death. The sins of believers are acts of disobedience against the will of God, resulting from a failure to walk in the spirit. The Bible says that you and I must be different people. We hear a different voice. Somebody said we hear a different drummer. I don't think he's got a drum. But nevertheless he is a voice in our minds and in our hearts that reminds us of the word of God and reminds us of where we're supposed to be walking. Reminds us of how we're supposed to talk and how we're supposed to dress and reminds us of what's important in this world. By the way you and I are not the important ones. It's the unsaved that are important. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. And my friend, he called you and me that are saved. He said, would you go out and get them? Would you go bring them into my house? Would you go bring them to the word of God? Bring the word of God to them that they might be saved. The apostle Paul over in 1 Corinthians Chapter 15, I think it's verse 31, said something about, I die daily. Oh, Paul, I kind of know what he means. See, I get up and I get my plans all ready and I want to do this and that. But then I have to put me to death because that's not what God wants for me today. Paul said, I die daily. Paul said, I am crucified with Christ, and nevertheless I live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me in the life which I now live in the flesh. I live by the faith of the Son of God who loves me and gave himself for me. We need to reckon our old self to be dead. And Romans, if you'll turn over there, Romans chapter 6. Now, I've had most of these verses written down so I could just read them to you and save some time, but... I say Acts and then Romans and I want to go to chapter 6 and, and verse number 11. This one I didn't have written down. Likewise reckon ye also yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin but alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal bodies that ye should obey it in the lust thereof. Neither yield ye your members as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin, but yield yourselves unto God as those that are alive from the dead, and your members as instruments of righteousness unto God. For sin shall not have dominion over you, for you're not under the law, but under grace. Oh, to date, have you sold out to the Lord Jesus Christ? I mean, have you given up all? You've got a bank account. You've got a lot of money in it. But it's not yours. It should be God's. You've got a nice car, but it's not yours. It should be God's. 
everything that I am and everything that I have God gave it to me and God allowed me to have it and so it's not really mine he just let me use it for a while oh I'll tell you today it's such a blessing to use the things that God has provided for us but I've got to remember that's not mine they're his whatsoever he has given to me those belong to him forever and forever I'm just living on borrowed time I'm living until the day comes when Jesus said alright you've done enough come on home and be with me sin is that transgression of the law God gave those ten commandments you know it's so simple to see sin you get those ten commandments in Exodus chapter 20 and you begin to read down through them and it's amazing how many of those that we as Christians break on a regular basis whether it's in thought or, or whether it's in deed I find today that in Romans chapter 7 verse 7 what shall we say then is law sin God forbid day I had not known sin but the law but by the law for I had not known lust except the law has said thou shalt not covet my friend God gave me his word so I would know what sin is and he told me this shouldn't be in your life John 5, 1 John 5, 17 says all righteous unrighteousness is sin. It is a deed. If the deed is not absolutely right, then it's absolutely wrong, isn't it? Anything short of God's righteousness is sin. <laughs> Apart from Christ, even our righteousness are as filthy rags. Can you imagine that? He said, preacher, why are you putting me down? Why are you putting me I'm not, I'm not trying to put you down. But I'm trying to tell you what will drag you down. I'm trying to tell you what's going to pull you down. What's going to destroy your life. What's going to destroy your church. What's going to destroy the testimony of Jesus Christ in the city of Austin, Texas. My friend, God needs churches like this. He needs pastors like that. He needs men and women and young people to stand for his glory and to stand for his honor today. He, you are the chosen messengers like an angel of heaven that God has sent uh, to Daniel to tell him the truth or uh, like an angel of heaven that, that God sent to protect the Hebrew children or that angel that, that God has sent to glorify his name. You in those places have been sent to a lost and a dying world that they might be saved. My friend, we spoke in, our, in the college class this morning about Jonah and how Jonah had been sent to Nineveh and God said go and he said no. And many of you have been in the same situation. God has called you to a ministry in the church. God has called you to work, to sing in the choir, to be an usher or to do whatever is necessary to go on visitation. Anybody can go on visitation. Old brother Howard Musgrave, the sister that won't answer his friend thing, her husband has since passed away, but he was a missionary for many, many years in Caracas, Venezuela. He went, when he couldn't go back to the field, he went to Edmond, Oklahoma and started a, a Spanish work. And he couldn't walk, he had a stroke, that's what kept him out of Venezuela. And so he took his little electric chair, that little scooter thing they got, and he went from house to house, bringing the gospel. He didn't let it stop him. And I've got people, and you've got people here, this whole preacher is too hot. I think it's too hot. It's too hot in here. I'm perspiring. I used to sweat, and then I got dignified, so now I just perspire. But, I, I, folks, there's always going to why you can't serve God. Satan's going to give you a multitude of them. He must have written uh, book after book after book about it. But I found something else. In your life and in mine, the Bible said, in the book of Romans chapter 14 verse 23, if you read it, you'll find a phrase in there that says that whatsoever is not of faith is sin. Whatsoever is not of faith is sin. How, how big is your faith? How strong is your faith? What is your faith in? Some of you have faith in the almighty dollar. You're going to get disappointed. Some of you have faith in the government. <laughs> I'm afraid you're going to be disappointed. Some of you have faith in your church. And some of you have faith in your preacher. I'm sorry. They're good. But they're going to fail one time or another. But I need to have faith in God. Faith in God. 
that this is God's word and he sent his son to die for me on Calvary's cross. Oh, I tell you what today, Proverbs 24, 9 says, the thought of foolishness is sin. Oh, so many things. Did you know the Bible said so much about sin? It's always talking about sin and we begin to read those things. Thou knowest my downsettings and my uprisings. Thou understandest my thought afar off. And foolish thoughts are sin in the eyes of the Almighty God. Well, we're coming to a close. Probably none too soon. No, it should have been a while ago. You know what sin does? You know what sin does in the church? It enslaves people. Puts a ring in your nose, hooks the strap to it, and this leads you wherever Satan wants you to go. We get to the point that we almost have no ability to say no. It hurts not to sin when sin has got a hold of us. Sin is a culprit that, my friend, you don't want to know him. Ephesians 2.12 says that at that time you were without Christ, being aliens, uh, alienated from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in this world. Some of you may be here today enslaved by sin and you do not know Jesus. My friend, that's the man I told you about. He's enslaved by sin. He's never murdered anybody that I know of. He seems to be a real nice guy, dressed as well, has been successful in the world. But my friend, when he dies, his sin will lead him over to hell. What a terrible way to end a life. What a terrible way to lose a life. What a terrible way to spend eternity where the worm dieth not. My friend, where the fires never cease. Why? Because of sin. I asked a young man in my office one year, many years ago, and I asked him, I gave him the plan of salvation. I asked him if he'd accept Jesus as his Savior. He said, well, not right now. Oh, that's a dumb answer. He said, not right now. <laughs> Forgive me, but I'm a little bit bold. And so I looked him in the eye and I said, let me ask you, what sin are you committing that's so great that you're willing to take a chance with your life for eternity? He wouldn't tell me. He never did tell me. You don't have to. I'm not a priest. I'm not Jesus. He confesses his sin to Jesus. Amen. He dropped his head. And as uncouth as I am, I just sat there and let him drop his head. I knew that he was thinking. Pretty soon he lifted up his head. He said, Pastor, I want to get saved now. Amen. He's going to break the yoke of sin. Going to cast off the heavy weight of sin. Going to cast it off in front of that great cloud of witnesses. He's going to cast it off and, and he's going to start running the race of Christ and Christians. He's got starting running the race against time. The race when the time will be no more and souls will no longer be saved. He got saved. How glorious it is when someone gets saved. Sin is a mighty destroyer. It destroys all it touches. Words cannot be too severe or drastic to describe the destruction of sin. In our country, in our world, we've seen the result of sin. They call it AIDS sometimes. Oh, it sweeps through many nations abroad. It's even here in this country today because of men's sin primarily. I, I read somewhere at least 90% of AIDS is sin related. And then add to the AIDS the misery of pain and shame and death caused by herpes or syphilis or gonorrhea or any of those such diseases caused directly or indirectly by sin. My friend, I, I look out there and I've seen homes fail that should never have failed. I've seen husbands and wives 
get angry with each other, come to a conclusion that we cannot live together anymore. Oh, my friend, the Bible said that we ought not be divided. We ought not be separated. And that sin, my friend, affects those children and, and the grandchildren, my friend. I just go through it and I see the hurt and I see the pain and I see the tears. And it never, never, never ends. That's what sin does. Oh, I wish those people would have come to the altar. That husband and that wife would have come to the altar and bowed, knelt on their face before God and said, Lord, forgive me of my sin and began to, to enumerate the, the, the sins that they had sinned against each other and God. And they'd ask God for forgiveness. I think they'd have found another outcome for their home and their children would have rejoiced. Oh, today... Sin kills 50% of all highway fatalities are, are attributed to alcohol. Sin kills. If sin were not deceitful, somebody said it would not be delightful. None can enjoy the pleasures of sin even for a season. Oh, how wise that man was in the book of Hebrews. Let's turn back there to close. Chapter 11, that chapter, that great chapter on faith. By faith Moses, when he was born, verse 23, was hid three months of his parents because they saw he was a proper child and they were not afraid of the king's commandment. A godly set of parents raised a godly son in a very, very trying time. By faith Moses, when he was come to years, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. Verse 25, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God, that by the way they were slaves, than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. My friend, he chose whom he would serve, like Joshua. For me and my house we will serve the Lord. Esteeming the reproach of Christ, greater riches than the treasures of Egypt. For he had respect unto the recompense of the reward, by faith he forsook Egypt, not fearing the wrath of the king, for he endured as seeing him who is invisible. Oh, did you get the picture? Sin destroys, and faith gives new life. By grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. Not of works lest any man should boast. Sin drags you down. Jesus in, in Psalms 40 verse 1 and 2 I believe it was. Lifts you out of the pit. And sets you upon the rock. Now whom would you serve? Would you serve the spirit of evil, Satan? Or would you serve the spirit of goodness and love and kindness and gentleness? The Lord Jesus Christ. You get to choose. Success or failure. Some of you may be here this morning and you may walk out of this building choosing failure rather than success. I pray for you because I know what sin can do. I've been around the block. Sin doesn't like you. He just wants you so he can flaunt you before God and say, look, look what I did. <laughs> I stole him from you. Christians, you know, somebody told me the other day that pornography is rampant in our churches. Could that be here? Pornography is a problem. It just leads to more and more sin. Well, I got to quit preaching. Time's up. Don't go to hell. Come, let's go to heaven together. Would you stand with me for prayer? Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus, I pray that I would have made sense this morning somehow, in some way. That, Lord, that these people might realize the seriousness of sin. They might put some new meaning on sin. They might see sin more clearly in their lives. They might realize that the power of God is, di is diminished because of sin. 
Lord, they might realize that without Jesus, they will perish for eternity. Lord, would you touch our hearts. That, Lord, that we might hear your voice. We might come this morning confessing our sin. We might come asking forgiveness. We might come and, and, and lay at thy feet as on holy ground. Praying for purity and cleanliness. Lord, I pray if one is here that's not saved, that they would get saved this morning by coming and telling this pastor that they want to know how to be saved. That forgiveness of sin could be total and complete in their lives. I ask in Jesus' name, amen. We'll sing a verse or two of invitation.